still continues. Um, many, Lord, thank you for his faithfulness. Um, thank you for um, the church and, Lord, desire to train and teach and pastor and all of those things. And so we pray that as we look at his life and his theology that you will build us up <clears throat> in that and strengthen us in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy birthday. Okay. So a lot of background, which I got kind of wrapped up in because it's like really interesting. So I'm going to try to go fast through it, but it's really cool. So RC. Who knows what RC stands for? It's besides Ron and Rhoda. Robert, Robert Charles. Oh, Robert Charles Sproul was born. And his father was Robert Cecil. Yes. Ooh. Robert Cecil. And his son was RC something. Yeah. He was born uh, to a family full of RCs, Roberts, and Bobs. Um, he was born February 13th, 1939 in Pleasant Hills, Pennsylvania, a suburb of Pittsburgh. And that Pittsburgh was kind of his identity for so much of who he was. Massive Pittsburgh Steelers fan, etc. You know, working class, steel worker, community kind of thing in the World War II era there. Um, he died December 14th, 2017 of COPD complications in Florida. So very recently, many of us watched... Uh, his funeral and, and felt that kind of loss, you know. He's best known as a theologian and author, a pastor, and founder of Ligonier Ministries. And so some background. Um, the Sproul family were longstanding members of the Methodist Church until the Pleasant Hills Community Church opened, which was Presbyterian. And they said, let's go there. So they actually converted from Methodist to Presbyterian. And that, again, was another transformative moment in R.C.'s life. He loved the Presbyterian um, liturgy, even though the church itself was very li li uh, liberal, the liturgy, he just, it left a big impact on him as a youngster, and he continued as a Presbyterian the rest of his life. He met his wife, Vesta Voorhis, when he was in the first grade, and she was in the second grade. So, young love. She didn't, really, she didn't really like him very much at that point. He certainly loved her. Um, in the elementary and junior high years, he was all about sports and Vesta. He and Vesta were in the church choir and the school choir together. And he commented that though the theology was awful in his church, he commented that most of the knowledge I had of the content of Christianity came from the music that we were singing. It's very, very important that we sing good songs with good theology. In 1957, he went to Westminster College in New Wilmington, PA, about an hour away, roomed with his high school buddy, Johnny. And of course, they wanted nothing more than to get into trouble with drinking and smoking and going to nearby places to uh, create havoc and ruckus. But he was converted at Westminster in a truly bizarre turn of events uh, in the first semester of his first year at Westminster. Rule trivia, uh, I was also, well, not converted, but I met Melanie the first semester of my first uh, freshman year. So. Me too! You met her too? Oh, you met Rhoda. <laughs> <laughs> he married Vesta June 11th, 1960. He still had one more year to go in college, so he was a junior. She was done, uh, so she started working immediately. He felt a call to go to Pittsburgh Theological Seminary after he was converted. There he met his most influential mentor, a guy named John Gerstner, who was horror of horrors, a reformed Calvinistic theologically conservative professor, which he wanted nothing to do with at that time. It was also a totally liberal school. So the, I, the, the chances of him meeting a Calvinistic reformed theologically conservative professor at a liberal school were basically none, but he did, and he got stuck with this guy. This guy had a terrible reputation of chewing students up, and so that was a big challenge to R.C., so he went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mr. Gerstner, and uh, he, as he reports in one, one encounter, he wiped him from the spot that he was standing on. Who wiped who? Gerstner oh, wiped yeah. Sproul oh, from God. the oh, spot oh, he God. was standing on, and he emerged a reformed uh, Calvinistic conservative shortly thereafter. Um, side trivia, famous classmate of R.C. Sproul at the seminary was Fred Rogers from 
Mr. Oh, Rogers. Really? Really? Mr. Rogers. Mr. Rogers. One of his biggest theological influences was none other than Jonathan Edwards, who we studied last week, who said theology is both rational and biblical. Yes, sir. Can I tell a story about how R.C. originally hated philosophy? And he would sneak, he would hold his textbook. Yes, I'll finish my cookie. <laughs> he wasn't reading the philosophy textbook. He was reading Jonathan Edwards' sermons. Yes. And he had like copies of it. He was like hiding it behind his book. He originally hated philosophy, which is completely ironic considering what he did in life. He mastered that trick in high school because he used to put the book up and sleep behind. <laughs> but when he got saved, he just wanted to read more and more theology, so he would put the philosophy book up and then read Jonathan Edwards, as Ronald said. This is why was Mr. Rogers in seminary? He was. Yeah. Mr. Rogers was an ordained Presbyterian minister. Yeah. yeah. I just don't tell my daughter Rogers. that. I love Mr. Rogers. <laughs> Mr. Rogers being. So after graduating, yeah, we'll the movie. It, was good. it was good. Uh, after graduating with his MDiv, he wanted to jump right into pastoring full time. He's like, I'm just going to go. I'm going to go into ministry. However, his friend and mentor, Dr. Gerstner, was secretly sabotaging all his ministerial interviews. So RC would respond to ads. He would have a great phone interview, and then he would go to interview with the church in person. But by then, Dr. Gerstner had gotten to the church and said, do not hire this guy. <laughs> because he wanted him to go on to doctoral work. So R.C. literally couldn't get a job. And so finally he said, okay, fine, I'll go get my doctorate. And Gerstner said, in 1964, you need to go to the Netherlands. You need to go to the Free University of Amsterdam and uh, start there. Uh, there was, I think it was Burkhauer was there. Um, that he was kind of rough for him in Vesta. He missed, as he quotes, ice meet disposable income and professors who spoke English. <laughs> they lived on peanut butter and jelly. His first semester reading consisted of 25 books in Dutch, <laughs> four in Latin, four in German, and four in French, which was especially difficult because he knew no French, no Dutch, and no German, and it was really bad in Latin. It took him, <laughs> he reports it took him 12 hours to read the first page of a Dutch textbook because he had to look up every single word. Oh. And he, we know that because he wrote 12 hours in the margin of that book. Yikes. In 1965, however, he had to return home because Vesta was pregnant with their second child, R.C. Jr., and his mom was terminally ill. His mom passed away soon after they got home. But while he was home, he became ordained. He was an ordained minister in the uh, press, in another the UPC uh, denomination, which he would not spend all his time there, but that's where he started. He then started picking up teaching jobs while he was still stateside. He taught at Gordon College for a while and left because they were a little bit too liberal. He taught at the, Gord, uh, the Conwell School of Theology in Philly. And in 1969, although he didn't actually finish his dissertation with that, that uh Free University of Amsterdam, they gave him a doctor's degree or a DRS degree, which is essentially an equivalent to a master's, but it wasn't the full PhD. So he actually never finished. He tried to do it with correspondence and being sponsored by other things, but he actually never finished his doctoral degree um, from that. Since then, he's gotten like two other PhDs. One of them was honorary. I think another one. When you write as much as he did, they just looked at his whole catalog and were like, yeah, you qualify. <laughs> so... 1969, he also started serving as an associate minister of theology and evangelism. Side note, they hired him as associate pastor of evangelism, and he said he wouldn't take the job unless they put theology in that title as well. So they did. That was at College Hill Presbyterian Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, where he met a woman named Dora Hillman, who was a wealthy widow who funded the formation of a study center. And I'll probably talk about this later, but that was Ligonier. That's where that started. She was so enamored with him. Uh, he taught at a retreat where she was at, and she came up to him afterwards and said, money, no object. What could you do if you could do anything? And he said, I would make a study center in the middle of nowhere, and I would teach people the word of God, whoever wanted to come. And she was like, deal. And so she sponsored and bought the property 
that would soon be uh, Ligonier in Pennsylvania. <coughs> what, what was her name? Dora Hillman. So we started the Ligonier Valley Study Center in 1971 in Ligonier Valley, Pennsylvania. It relocated to Florida in 1984 and simply renamed Ligonier Ministries. And if you're familiar with them, they have countless resources, articles, tapes, videos, books, tracks. They publish a monthly magazine called Table Talk, which is a devotional magazine. And that is an estimated readership of a quarter of a million people across 50 countries at this point. Ligonier also launched the Reformation Bible College in 2011. You know, just start college while you're down there. And in 1997, he planted St. Andrew's Chapel in Sanford, Florida at the urging of others at age 58. He did not want to be a pastor. He was down there. He was totally content doing what he was doing with Ligonier. But people said, no, we need a church and you're the guy. And so eventually gave in and he loved it and he later said in somewhat remorse that i regret that it took me to age 58 to regularly preach god's word every single week to a church which he just loved doing till the day he died so kind of a big tour of mr rc well, let's talk about his conversion we have a conversion story Woo! so 1957 one night at westminster him and buddy johnny decided to go to youngstown ohio if you're in a college every college knows where the closest bar town is and for them it was youngstown ohio and they could get into bars underage rc found out that he was out of smokes so he decided ah, i gotta go back to campus to buy smokes so he goes back to the college campus at westminster to go to the cigarette machine where he runs into two people who were having a Bible study. One of them was the captain of the football team. So RC, as he's putting quarters in the cigarette machine <laughs> to buy his lucky strikes, the captain of the football team says, uh, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm just getting cigarettes. I'm getting out of here. And he said, we're having a Bible study. Do you want to join us? And RC was like, what is a Bible study? He literally had no idea. It was the first one he'd ever seen. And all of his like orthodox liturgy, like he never saw two people just sitting down in a cafe studying the Bible. So he was fascinated by that. And he joined them. And they covered a verse. And Ellie, <laughs> brother's already laughing. Ecclesiastes 11.3, which, uh, you know, you would think a guy like R.C. Sproul would be, you know, so converted by such a, a deep, massively important verse. And so we'll read this, and I'm sure you will be equally <laughs> just struck by the powerfulness of this verse. If the clouds are full of rain, they empty themselves on the earth. And if a tree falls to the south or to the north, in the place where the tree falls, there it will lie. <laughs> <laughs> he said he was cut in two. He saw himself as that tree. He saw himself in a state of torpid paralysis, fallen, rotting, and decaying. He left the table. He returned to his dorm room, and when he entered, he didn't turn on the light. He just knelt down beside his bed, praying to God, asking him to forgive his sins. <laughs> what? <laughs> So he said there was something odd about him. Yeah. <laughs> he said he was probably the only person in history ever converted to Christ by that verse. Yes. And his colleagues changed it to, it's definitely not probably. You're definitely <laughs> the only person that was ever converted to Christ by that verse. Still, he realized that he was spiritually dead, even though he had considered himself a Christian up until that point. It struck him, to, the, the deadness of that tree and the deadness of his own heart. But now he knew what Christianity was all about. And I'll read a little bit. This is written by one of his buddies. The uh, R.C. Sproul biography by Dr. Nichols. And he's now the president of Reformed Bible College, I believe. Right? <coughs> yes, he is. So here's a little bit. Uh, is R.C. himself reflecting on his conversion. I'm coming up on the 60th anniversary of my conversion to the Christian faith. It was September of 1957, and I will never forget. I think I'm the only person in the history of church, the church, <clears throat> to be converted by a particular verse that God used to open my heart and my eyes to the truth of Christ. It came from the book of Ecclesiastes, 
where the author of Ecclesiastes describes in metaphorical terms a tree that falls in the forest, and where it falls, there it stays. And God awakened my soul by considering that passage. I saw myself as a tree falling, rotting, and decaying. And that was the description of my life. That's where I was. Nobody had to tell me I was a sinner. I knew that. It was abundantly clear to me. But when I went to my bedroom that night and got on my knees, my experience was one of transcendent forgiveness. I was overwhelmed by the tender mercy of God, the sweetness of his grace, and the awakening that he gave his life for me. And I pray that any of you who have not yet experienced an awakening of the reality of Christ would have that experience in your life, that you would look carefully at the scriptures and the word of God, and that the word may be used in power to quicken your soul and your spirit, that you too may be awakened to the fullness of glory, peace, and joy that is ours in Christ. That's his account of his conversion as well. But R.C. was dramatically changed after that. He read his Bible, although he never read his Bible before. He read the whole Bible through in just two weeks. He changed his major from history to religion. But he had one problem. Vesta. <laughs> Vesta was not saved. Vesta was not converted. So about a month later, or a few months later, while visiting him at Westminster, he invited her to come to a prayer meeting. And there, too, she was converted. Even though she hadn't attended church for years, she felt the Holy Spirit working and drawing her to Christ. R.C., once he got back home, was excited to tell his pastor about his conversion. His pastor promptly replied, if you believe in the physical resurrection of Christ, then you're a damn fool. <laughs> Remember, it was a very liberal Presbyterian <clears throat> congregation. He tried to find some spiritual mentors uh, at his school, which was pretty hard to do. In 1958, he met a man called Dr. Gregory, who found people like Augustine and Hume, and therefore he changed his major to philosophy, and he graduated with that bachelor's in philosophy. Around that time, though, he had a second conversion. In the middle of the night, in the dead of winter, he got up and went to the chapel, uh, on the campus of Westminster. And it's a very long account by him, but I'm not going to read the whole thing, even though it is absolutely beautiful. Um, so dead of night, he said, it's just beautiful the way he describes it. The snow is falling, freshly falling. You know, in the dead of night when it's snowing, it's just like dead silent and all that. And he just gets compelled to get out of bed, and he knew he had to go to the chapel. He was just where he was supposed to be. So he began to walk down the center aisle of the chapel, and my footsteps sounded like the hobnail boots of German soldiers marching up cobblestone streets. I could hear them reverberating throughout the chapel. Finally, I reached the chancel. I knelt at that place and had a sensation of foreboding loneliness. I sensed that I was absolutely alone, and then almost in an instant, I was overcome by the sense of another presence. It was almost tactile. It was like I could reach out and touch the massive presence of God. I just knelt there and basked in this sensation of being in the presence of God. I had an inner conflict of two emotions colliding in my heart. On the one hand, I had this dreadful fear. I had the sensation, this chill that began at the base of my spine and ran all the way up my back into my fingers and I had goosebumps in my flesh. I was clearly frightened by the, a sense of the presence of God. And yet, at the same time, I felt drawn to luxuriate, to bask in that moment. I sensed an overwhelming flood of peace come into my soul. It was one of those experiences I wanted to continue forever and didn't want to move. He had this experience, really, of the holiness of God. And that would shape his ministry for the rest of his life, that, that second conversion, as he calls it, right? He then decided to go to seminary at Pittsburgh, and he met Gerstner, <clears throat> really transitioned to Calvinistic Reformed faith, and uh, then everything was set in motion after that, uh, his ministry and his life and his theology, which we'll get into. But comments and thoughts about Sproul and his first and second conversions It's a very contemporary story. Yeah. Very easy to relate to. Yep. Dates and times and places are, are, are uh, you know, the 
in our lifetimes. And uh, I think we were talking about this earlier. It's it's it's, it's amazing that there's um, you know somebody who's such a giant of the faith that's really contemporary to us. It, it mm -hmm. seems like these things sort of happened in the past. But he's, you know, yeah, he's our contemporary. Yeah, it's great. Yep. Kind of like that. That his first conversion, like like when the Holy Spirit came down in Acts, you know, it just yeah. consumed him. You know, like yep, the fire had come. Yep. You know, uh, just the conviction and the yeah. wind, right? And just yeah, it just overwhelmed everybody, man. Yep. And and and, and everyone was changed forever. You know. Yep. It, it, it's so Spirit. wild how it's kind of like. There's almost three stages, right? Because he was a church-going guy. He would say he was a Christian, but he wasn't. And he was converted by this crazy verse about a dead tree. And then he gets drawn again into deeper to contemplate the, the not only the, the holiness, right, but then also the, the, the personal presence of God. It's just it's an amazing story to think about that. I think it's kind of amazing that his old pastor's response to his own conversion. Yeah. With the belief system. And that with the church's with, with the pastoral response that he got, that the thing that God gave him was his inspiration was God's own holiness. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I thought it was interesting that um, just uh, two people having a Bible study had mm -hmm. um, that much yep. of an impact. Yeah, good point. Another person you never know. Yep. You know, um, what little thing that you do yep. could have a big impact on somebody else's life. Yeah, especially in public, right? Yeah. yeah. Like when we're at the diner. Yep. And it's Bible study, shameless plug, right? Yeah. You know, where's our Bibles open and all that stuff. I, when I was at uh, working at Starbucks before I had the law office, right, I would always have my Bible open. Even if I wasn't actually working on anything from the Bible, I would just open it up and, and leave it there. Most of the time, people recoil. But, Ooh. It's a Bible. We keep walking. But every once in a while, somebody would sit down and want to talk. Well, let's talk about one of the central themes of his theology, which was the holiness of God. This was his lifelong focus and perhaps his most important book. He said, we need to get out of our self-made cave and walk in the glorious light of God's holiness. And he had many passages and many things, but one of his favorite ones to talk about the holiness of God was Isaiah chapter 6. And I'll read a little bit of his comments on Isaiah chapter 6, 174. R.C. says, to be undone, right? If you, if you, let me just, let me read that. Because we're jumping into the middle of his commentary. It doesn't doesn't do it justice you know you've got to read Isaiah 6 the first couple verses right in the year that King Uzziah died right I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple above him stood the seraphim each had six wings with two he covered his face and with excuse me two he covered his feet and with two he flew and one called to the other and said holy 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 is the Lord of hosts the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And he said, and I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Powerful picture of the throne room in the words of Isaiah. And then R.C.'s response about uh, Isaiah saying he's undone. Woe is me. To be undone means to come apart at the seams, to be unraveled. What Isaiah was expressing is what modern psychologists describe as the experience of personal disintegration. To disintegrate means exactly what the word suggests, disintegrate. Isaiah caught one sudden glimpse of a holy God. In that single moment, all of his self-esteem was shattered. In a brief second, he was exposed, made naked beneath the gaze of absolute holiness. 
As long as Isaiah could compare himself to other mortals, he was able to sustain a lofty opinion of his own character. But the instant he measured himself by the ultimate standard, he was destroyed, morally and spiritually annihilated. He was undone. He came apart. You see that coming through again. Like you can picture him in that chapel with that, that moment. right? Um, he said, what do people in the church need to know most about God? And that he's holy. And he said, what do people in the culture need to know most about God? <laughs> that he's holy. We had three themes in his theology of holiness. And it's quite simple. God is holy. We are not. And therefore, we need a substitute. We are, we are hopelessly not holy. We are hopelessly not God. A little different tonight because of all of our other giants of the faith, they never had such a thing as videos. And we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of videos of R.C. Sproul. And so I'm going to play a little video. It's a compilation of him throughout the years talking about God's holiness. And um, I got a kick out of it, so I hope you will too. Jesus in the midst of the tempest. <laughs> yeah, baby. The oh. Oh. They are fearful. Yeah, and they watch the back of the boat and they grab him and they say, Jesus, wake up, do something. He says, What's the matter? What's the matter? He sees the storm, and he said, Watch that when he says, All right, peace, be still. And the sea stops its raging and the winds become calm. What's the response of the disciples? when Jesus removes the clear and present threat of nature. Does it say they throw their sou'westers in the air and rejoice and say, oh, we knew you would do it? No. The text tells us that at that moment, they became very much of it. The biggest problem that the human race has is this. God is holy. He's righteous. He's just, and we're not. And it's because God is holy that any time he withholds justice, he is giving grace. Listen to what the Bible tells us. The king of the universe places his indelible mark on the soul of every one of his people. I think one of the most important things we do is, is to try to, to deepen our understanding of the character of God. Because he's holy. And we're not. There is only one characteristic of Almighty God that is communicated in the superlative degree from the mouths of angels, where the Bible doesn't simply say that God is holy. Or even that he's holy holy but that he is holy 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 that's like saying the best of the best or the worst of the worst the heavenly hosts above the throne of god singing to each other in antiphonal response a single word repeated over and over and over again Holy, holy, holy. The only reason you exist and that I exist is for him. We must come to understand that even though we have this built-in antipathy and fear towards the Holy One, and even though we recognize that we are unholy, in Christ, ladies and gentlemen, we are welcome. Oh, goosies. <laughs> He's so good. All right, one more since I'm here. No comments from Ron or Rhoda. If God is slow to anger and patient, excuse me, since God is slow to anger, <laughs> we're always learning. Since God is slow to anger and patient, then why, when man first sinned, was his wrath and punishment so severe and long-lasting? Time out. 
Didn't we just have that question a second ago? We did. Yeah. It's a little, think little, we little did. nuance. That God's punishment for Adam was so severe. This creature from the dirt defied the everlasting holy God. After that, God had said, the day that you shall eat of it, you shall surely die. And instead of dying, Thanatos, that day, he lived another day and was clothed in his nakedness by pure grace and had the consequences of a curse applied for quite some time. But the worst curse would come upon the one who seduced him, whose head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. And the punishment was too severe. What's wrong with you people? I'm serious. I mean, this is what's wrong with the Christian church today. We don't know who God is. And we don't know who we are. <laughs> the question is, the question is, why wasn't it infinitely more severe? If we have any understanding of our sin, any understanding of who God is, that's the question. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah, so if you if you if you ever see a guy walking around with a uh I don't know. If God is slow to anger, have a patient. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> they make t-shirts and coffee mugs that say that. What's wrong with you people? <laughs> but yeah, so you, you, you get a, a good look there. The first video, of course, at his uh, his heart still in holiness and just how tender. And we're over five decades, right? All the RCs from, you know, 70 big collar RC to handsome 80s RC to, he had some serious flow in the 80s. <laughs> and then the 90s and you know, 2000s where everything caught up to him, basically. <laughs> I never got to see him preach live. I went to T4G, um, it was 2016, and his doctor had already, he was supposed to preach, but his doctor told him no. Wasn't there, but anyway, thoughts on anything about holiness or anything from the videos that we just saw? Reactions, Ronald. <laughs> I used to not like RC Sproul when I was a young man. Lodo was a big fan from the first time she heard him. I used to call him RC Boar because I was like, this guy just goes on. What? It's so technical. Like, what's the point? And Probably 10 years after that fact, um, I started to really get challenged into apologetics, and I stumbled upon him and, and sadly, Robbie, who was a huge influence too. But R.C. Sproul had this way about him that he can communicate smartly, mm -hmm. but clearly at the same time, mm -hmm. and with enough conviction and passion where I just I would just get so... I mean, as for how many countless hours of R.C. Sproul that I've listened to over the years, just because I feel like I, he's like my grandfather. I, I yeah. feel his heart coming out of his his teaching and his ministry. Yeah, yeah, it's just really amazing. But um, <clears throat> we lived probably I don't know forty minutes from Sanford for a million years and never went to look at it. <laughs> and my wife will never forgive me for that. It's the one unforgivable. We just never she went. Should. Yeah. We watched his funeral though, so I made up for that. Thank you. Other comments? Of, what, what do you think? Especially of that video. I mean, it's kind of a it's kind of a you know. The last video where he, he really <laughs> he scolds the entire conference. I ran across that somehow several months ago. I was absolutely floored by it. Yeah. Because his, his response was just it was so sharp and yeah. so strong and clear. And it, it just made the point. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> we're blown away by it. Yeah. Very passionate about the holiness of God, right? And you see, even at that conference, I, I don't know if it was a Ligonier conference or what, but you know, that downplaying of sin in light of a holy God is so prevalent, even among evangelicals, and it just didn't stand for a second with R.C. He just, just called he just, it out. He just squashed it immediately. And yeah. this goes back to 
and he alludes to it in the talking about the garden that say these first lie it's like yeah. surely you won't die like did God yeah. really say that so just undermining the truth and RC has a legacy of 50 plus years where he's sticking to his guns and he's absolutely right yeah the church has forgotten the position we, we get so self man centered yeah that we forget our sin why do you think that is why do why does the church downplay God's holiness because it's confrontation oh sorry this isn't a discussion <laughs> go to the bathroom see you guys okay <laughs> thanks, thanks bro what do you think? Any thoughts on why the church kind of doesn't focus as much on this kind of... Popular. It's not popular. Yeah, why isn't it popular? Because it calls out our sin. Because it calls out our <laughs> sin, right? I mean, you can't really overestimate God's holiness. I think it's the beginning of John when he said that the light shone in the darkness, but the people loved the darkness more. Right. And darkness sells, and self-centeredness sells. Yeah, and I can literally sit down with a billion list of sins and circle every single one of them around the fact that that sin elevates yourself and de-elevates the holiness of God yeah. and how it's manifested. I mean, just like we were talking the other day, I think it was with Val actually. If you're listening, Val, this is a plug for us. <laughs> we were talking about how um, in the culture people are. They've, they've not got any idea of what perversion is. Right. Um, there is none. Right. They, and oh, they know. They really, yeah. They're they, pushing it down below. They glorify yeah. it. They glorify yeah. the concepts that are, by the very definition of the context, perverse. But here's the thing that scares me because I'm watching a generation that was able to do that because they didn't have a concept of the sacred. Well, you can't have a concept of the sacred if you don't have a concept of the holy. Right. So right. all of those things. Yeah. Coming back to understanding what you are as an unholy thing, what God is as a divinity and is holy, yeah. and just the plethora of areas that we misplace glory in, or that mm-hmm. we we sacrifice <clears throat> uselessly and displace the glory of God for useless things. Right. You know. And what an offense that is to a perfectly, completely holy God. Exactly. It's hard to it's hard to understand. Many Christian leaders and, and, and the culture considers that negative. You know right. I mean? We don't want to talk about sin. We don't want to talk it, about holiness. It's negative yeah. thinking. Well, you know, you got to move to church. It's not very seeker friendly. I'm more positive thinking. It's just negative. And uh, it just drags you down. But, but, but what is dragging you up toward glory? It drags you down. But again, if what that sets up, right? If we do highlight the holiness of God, and the sinfulness of us, right, and our complete inability to even stand in the presence like Isaiah, right, then what does that highlight? The awesomeness of the gospel, mm-hmm. the good news. Like, if, if the bad news isn't as bad as it could be, right, that, that's what's the hardest thing about evangelizing people is convincing them that they're sinners. Well, the bad they news is as bad as it can be. No, I know. But the good news is as exactly. good as it can be. Right, but people don't. <laughs> Think yeah. that the bad news is that right. bad, right? Even, you know, certainly not the world, to Rhoda's point, right? Because they don't think they're sinners and they need a savior. They think they're pretty good people, right? Yeah. But also in the church, they we certainly don't, don't like to be made uncomfortable. No, definitely not. You know, impinging upon their safe space. And that's why the gospel gets then demoted too to like, oh, well, don't you want to go to heaven when you die? Yeah, sure. Okay, that sounds good. And it leaves out the whole like, whoa, no, we are, we are woefully, we're undone. We should be undone, and we're without hope were it not for a savior. You take away the truth out of the gospel, and yeah. the only thing that's left that the church has as a marketable experience is its Christian culture, yeah. which ends up leading to seeker-friendly atmospheres with laser lights, glory dust, and sacred fog. Feathers, you know, whereas feathers, yes. Whereas the the truth-seeking Christian community, there is nothing that has more of a value and is a drawing factor than right understanding of what we are and right understanding of what God is and yeah. right understanding of atonement and sacrifice. Yeah, amen. What amen. struck me, and I didn't think about that until now, R.C., uh, man does, God told man, if you eat of this fruit, you should yeah. surely die. Yeah. So automatically, as soon as he ate, he should have been smitten. Yeah. And then it, 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 it yeah. right, and then all of a sudden grace was introduced yep. immediately in the garden. Yep. Right? Yep. That, I didn't that that didn't grab me until I just yeah. heard that. It's wild to think about. 
Yeah. So we had a couple other big theological themes, and we'll see how many of these we get through. Um, one of them was inerrancy. Whoa, what just happened there? Um, <clears throat> Wouldn't have had the Bible right? Come on now, Mr. Proclaim. So inerrancy? What do we mean by inerrancy? The inerrancy of Without scripture. Error. Without error. And so things were shaping, and, and you realize how far back RC goes. So the 20th century, uh, really early 19, uh, 19 well, late 1900s, right? So probably 40s, 50s, Rudolf Boltman shows up and his theology then became more of an experience, uh, more of a here and now divorced from history. And R.C. was like, this is totally wrong. The Bible is the record of God's historic works of redemption within the context of space and time. If you take the gospel and its message out of the context of history, he said, Christianity is destroyed altogether. And then the 60s and 70s, Karl Barth shows up and he stresses that human beings err, but they wrote scripture, and God doesn't err. So what do we have then? Basically what we have left, he said, really can't be the word of God because humans wrote it. And so right then and there, we started the attacks, not only on, on what uh, theology was as an experience, not historical, and then attacks on inerrancy of scripture that were shaping up and R.C. again rose immediately to the occasion to fight that. And the uh, Ligonier then responded with their own statement. And they said this, We believe the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testaments to be inspired and inerrant word of God. We hold the Bible as originally given through the agents of Revelation to be infallible and see this as a crucial article of faith with implications for the entire life and practice of all Christian people. With the great fathers of Christian history, we declare our confidence in the total trustworthiness of the scriptures, urging that any view which imputes to them a lesser degree of inerrancy than total is in conflict with the Bible's self-testimony in general and with the teaching of Christ in particular. Out of obedience to the Lord of the church, we submit ourselves unreservedly to his authoritative view of the Holy Writ. This crisis intensified in 1973, and it was time for action. R.C. knew, and there's, <laughs> there's kind of a very comical little, little note in his journal. Um, in the midst of lecture notes in one of his spiral-bound notebooks with a $2.38 price tag on it, $2.38 price tag on it, R.C. sketched an outline for discussing inerrancy. So he's writing his battle plan here of, of doing this. It starts off with present crisis, Linzel was another guy on the scene, rupture. Next follows historical background, which then he notes evangelical, heritage, the five solas, sola scriptura. And at the end of this outline, he writes two things. We need an evangelical summit. And then he adds, it may fail, but we must try it. <laughs> <laughs> he knew it was time to take action. And the International Council on Biblical Inerrancy was launched in 1977, and they came out with the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy in 1978. That still stands today. If you go on the Highlands Bible Church website, under what we believe, you will find a link to the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, which says pretty much exactly in much expanded form what the Ligonier Statement said that we just read. And so R.C. has another video on what he would say to Christians who don't really believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. So tell us, R.C. Well, I think there are lots of people who are Christians who don't believe in the inerrancy of Scripture. I think they should. He's got the oxygen now. They're misinformed. And I think that uh, they may retain the essence of the Christian faith. They don't re they don't have the bene essay, the well-being of the Christian church, that there is a serious uh, shortfall in their lives by failing to come to grips with the absolute authority of the word of God in their lives. And so when you negotiate inerrancy, you set yourself at sea and you're uh, subject to the winds of every doctrine being blown to and fro and so on. So I think it's a very important doctrine. 
And even though it's, uh, it's one that is ridiculed and attacked and despised in our day and age, I think we have to be very careful to study this matter and to uh, maintain a high view of biblical authority. I don't want a view of, a, of, of the Bible that's any higher than Jesus. View. And I don't any, want to have any view of the Bible that's any lower than Jesus' view. All right, so biblical inerrancy. Was that voice in the middle? I, uh, maybe. I don't know what he looks oh, like. Oh. I'm not sure. They were buddies, for sure. I thought that was. Yeah. What's the big deal about biblical inerrancy? Is it important? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, either we're all liars, or there's a perception substantial of our faith then. Yeah. Yeah. Why is inerrancy another hill to die on? If even one thing is wrong, it could all be wrong. Yeah. And if it's all wrong, we'll be yeah. Because it claims like, to have nothing in it wrong. <laughs> yeah. What did you think at the end there where he said, uh, I don't want to have a higher view than Jesus. I don't want to have a lower view than Jesus. Jesus, we know. We've come across it in Matthew, right? He thought the Old Testament was Scripture. And it was the Word. It was God's Word. Right? God said. How many times did he say that? God said this. Right. Haven't you read? <laughs> Haven't you read? Yeah. yeah. He also didn't use it the way the Pharisees were using it. Right. Yeah. So he that's I love how he put that. Yeah. He, he used it the way that, that Christ used it without the Pharisees took things so literally they had the boxes on their heads. Yeah. Yeah. Really yeah. Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But Christ Plus he fulfilled it too. Exactly. Right? But he he used the scripture to his greatest use of it was when he was battling his greatest adversary with the temptations. Yeah. That was his, ex you know, mm -hmm. the way that he used it, that was by yeah. really yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Ronald. Robert Charles was the first person to introduce me to how logic plays a fundamental role yeah. in apologetics. And when I went through defending your faith the first time, he outlined the law of non contradiction. Yep. And you could see, even in conversational RC, he's yeah. still appealing to logic. Yeah. He's saying, I don't want a higher view of Jesus or a lower view of Jesus because they both can't be correct. Right. One thing has to be correct. Yep. And all the way back to the very principles of the word, Jesus is making claims to be God. Yep. So he's either liar, lunatic, or Lord, as, yep. as Clive Staples would say. Nice. So the, the logic is sound. They, something can't be A and non-A at the same time or the same yep. relationship. So either he's telling the truth or he's not. Yep. It's that simple. Yeah. Inerrancy is also very closely linked with authority. And so if it is the perfect word of God from God, then that means it's authoritative because it's from God. And because it's authoritative, that means we have to submit to it. That is the word of God. So yeah, you kind of pull one thread on that and everything falls apart. There are two other quick things I want to get to. We'll see how much we get to. But the other hill that he would definitely die on was justification by faith. In the uh, 1990s, there was an ecumenical movement called Evangelicals and Catholics Together, mm -hmm. which downplayed the central doctrine of justification by faith. Right? There was this list that came out that said, okay, well, we can, we're still talking about these like 10 things, you know, where we're, where we're going to, you know, agree to disagree. And even on that list that they put out, justification by faith wasn't even on there. And R.C. lost his mind. He said, that's a betrayal of the Reformation. Worse than that, that's a betrayal of the gospel and a betrayal of Christ. <laughs> you know, a guy grounded in the five solas and the Reformation, the whole thing, really the material uh, premise of the Reformation being justification yeah. by faith alone, right? Yeah. And they just threw it out the window. And so yeah. he definitely it went to war over that. that. Martin Luther even called James a, a straw. His whole straw. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it cost him several close friendships. And there were definitely some times where, you know, he really went to, there were people that were signing that document that, frankly, I'm shocked were signing that document. James Schaefer. Was yeah. one of them? James yeah. was one of them. Packer was one of them. Packer was one yeah, of them. Yeah, Packer. Yeah. And so they, they went toe-to-toe -to -toe on that. But it just wasn't, it, it, it was a non-negotiable for him. And justifiably so, pun not intended, right? That, you know, 
justification by faith. How are we justified in the sight of a holy God? That's the biggest question there is. Right? If you go soft on that, forget it. Um, I want to get to apologetics really quickly. And then, unless you guys want to stay here all night listening to me talk about R.C. Sproul. So apologetics, as Ron mentioned, he was big into apologetics, which is, as we know, defending your faith. But he wants to teach people knowing what you believe and why you believe it. That was one of the foundational reasons for starting Ligonier. He was a seminary professor. He was an author. He was an academic guy. But he said he loved nothing more than actually teaching lay people the Bible. He loved doing what he did at Ligonier. He was what's known as a classical apologist. Um, meaning that Christianity is logical. Christianity is rational, as we'll see on Sunday, foreshadowing. Really answering the question, okay, well, why is there something rather than nothing? And as Ron kind of mentioned earlier, there's, there's four key principles that he would talk about, meaning non-contradiction being the first one. This is an iPhone, not an Android. It can't be both an iPhone and an Android at the same time. Plus, you know I would never, ever own an Android. So truth has to be either A or B. It can't be both. Right? Maybe someday you'll grow up. Yeah, maybe someday. <laughs> the second was a law of causality. If there's an effect, something had to cause that. Right? Here we are today because we are holding a midweek study. So you guys knew that. So the effect of that is that you're here. Universe is an effect. The universe is, exists, so therefore, there has to be a cause for the universe. Third was sense perception, meaning we can know truth through sensing and experience. If we pick up an ice cube, we say, wow, that's cold. I know that's cold because I feel it. Now, senses aren't perfect, but still, they're very reliable and very consistent. If I touch fire, I know it's going to be hot. You can do that. That's the senses, right? And the last one was analogical language, meaning... An, an analogy of being, and really primarily, we can know God. And how do we know God? Because there's got to be some analogy there between God and us. Like, how do we even know? How do we communicate with God? How do we have a relationship with God? There's got to be something there that exists that's real. And if you drill down into it, it's the Imago Dei. It's, it's the image of God in our hearts that he's stamped on every single human being. So he's put a little bit of us inside him. So we have that, that language, that connection with someone as well. But he also focused on the danger of secularism. And this was in 1986. A secularism is a post-Christian phenomenon carrying its bag carrying in its baggage a conscious rejection of the Christian worldview. In other words, it's a presupposition that God can't exist. So we see that today. Secular, this is 1986 he was calling this out, but we see it in, in, in its exponential form today. God just can't exist. You, you can't ever give somebody enough evidence if they're convinced that God doesn't exist, that he does, right? And so he was calling out secularism as, as an apologetic method early on in 86 as well. And last and near and dear to my own heart, um, you know, he thought apologetics was a method for reaching non-believers, right, in um, the common sense of the faith and evangelism. But he also was big on uh, apologetics being for the church to equip Ephesians 4, to equip believers for the work of the church, right, to 1 Peter 3, to always be ready to give a reason for the hope that you have, give that defense. So not only is apologetics for non-believers and engaging with them the gospel, but it's also for the church to equip them. So these were some very radical kind of things. Most um, Reformed guys are not classical apologetics. They're of a different school, presuppositional. So R.C. was kind of breaking the mold there in the way that he laid down these four principles. So Thoughts, comments, questions? Yes, Ronald. No maverick molecules. <laughs> You didn't talk about sovereignty of God. Explain what you mean. R.C. was huge on sovereignty of God, and his famous quote is, even one molecule in the universe is out of God's control, and the whole thing would collapse. Yep. There are no maverick molecules in the universe. Yep. 
That's mind blowing. Even again, coming back to non contradiction, right? Either God's sovereign or He's not. Mm-hmm. He can't be all sovereign, and then there's a maverick molecule. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But this man I pedestal for the thousands of years that the church was the leader in education, and then oh, the secular arena took it over, and now we have forgotten how to be good biblical leaders. And I am a huge advocate for rightly dividing the word with the highest critical thinking skills and the best quality thinking skills and the best education and all of us could possibly have. Yeah. So no Amen. molecules. That means there's no free will then. Another tension in scripture. But yes, there's free will. Under his sovereignty. Oh my goodness, yes. That's so scary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Last thing, then I'll be quiet. A million years ago, Rhoda wrote a letter to RC. He's our favorite. Here, Paul. <laughs> and I said to Rhoda, there's no way he's going to respond. You know how much mail that guy gets? Like, he probably gets a million letters. If, you, if anything, you'll get like a pre-typed response from a secretary. And a couple months later, we have it framed over there if you want to check it out. He wrote right back this wonderful letter. And to this day, it sits in our little... It sits beside my desk. Yeah. <laughs> it's very personal and very loving. And he's awesome. What a blessing. I miss him. I'm a dead to him. I wish he were around today. You see him. No, we didn't make it a priority all these years. I wonder what he'd say speaking into this nonsense of everything that we see. He blow his oxygen tank. He would say, "What's wrong with you people?" (laughs) He'd blow his oxygen tank for sure. (laughs) Any other thoughts? These are all four points that are directly under attack from wokeism. Mm -hmm. Oh sure. I mean, and 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 it's it's almost well. I mean, it speaks to its source. It's Mm -hmm. it's very focused on these four things. It's Mm -hmm. not. It's not really other. I mean, other things get crossed, but it's really focused on these four things. Yeah. Uh, you know, there's it's the end of analogical language, sense and perception. You you know your perception of reality doesn't yeah. count. It's what I tell you, what I identify as. There's no causality in the non-contradiction thing. You'll hear this term thrown around like, oh, non-binary. That's that's exactly what it's. Yeah, about. exactly. That's exactly. exactly. What it's, yeah. it's a direct attack on these four things. Yeah. True. I hadn't thought of it like that. Yeah, he would be he would be blowing a blood vessel today for sure in twenty twenty two America. <laughs> I have to point out the one above it. Then Christianity is logical. I mean, people will say that it's not today. It's, right. You know, I mean, you just have faith. Yep. You know, I mean, Fideism. You, yeah, you know, yeah, and, yeah. And We're gonna talk about that on Sunday. Yeah. Oh, we have a big day on Sunday. Big day on Sunday. Big day on Sunday. Big day on Sunday. Paul's apologetic. Okay. Yeah, you're right though, Ken. And we've done ourselves no favors because we've put more bullets in the other side's gun with that. Because we've conceded the logic. Right. I don't have to know. I just believe. I just have more fuzzy feelings. And then they eat us alive. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. Rhoda's Rhoda's points. And RC's like, no, 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 no. We have some of the greatest thinkers ever. Like, what are you doing? That was the point of my whole letter to him, actually, when I was writing him. Was I want to thank you for pointing the necessary growth and life that comes to your faith if you actually study critical thinking, good reasoning, and, and actually learning to use your, you know, the God organs given about getting everybody about thinking. Yeah. Um, and I, I wrote him and I told him, I said, but, you know, you are really instrumental in helping me understand that lost arts like reason, linguistics, um, things that people don't think about anymore because we just like to be entertained. We don't like to think. Yep. Yeah. And I told him, I was like, thank you for not only expanding my faith, but for inspiring me to grow as a thinker. Mm-hmm. So, and that was why he wrote that. Yeah, that's so good. Cool. All right. Well, let me, yes. One last quick story. My favorite RC story. He was teaching the law of non-contradiction to his seminary students. He got up there and he said, if you say anything with a furrowed brow, and you say it with an air of mystery, people will believe you. But he got in front of his class and he held up a piece of chalk and he goes, this piece of chalk is not a piece of chalk. <laughs> and, then, and then he asked the class to explain it and they were all going into like the essence of chalkness and all these like <laughs> philosophical buzzwords. And he's like, no, you goops, it's the law of non-contradiction. What I said doesn't make any sense. <laughs> By definition, it has to be chalk. 
And he was just explaining, like, people will be beguiled by, you know, the, the, the skill of an orator. You can yeah. say it with enough conviction, people will yeah. believe you. Repeat a lie enough, and people will believe you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Logic is paramount. Yeah. Which actually is a great point, because going back and looking at the Messiah, and how he reasoned, mm-hmm. and, and how he understood language, and, right. and how he used the art of that. Masterful. I was thinking the same thing Masterful. just a minute ago. Yeah, when Jesus did it. Amen. Well, let me pray for us. God, thank you so much for tonight and for the life of R.C. Sproul. And Lord, we thank you for his, all of his progress and all of his resources that we still have. Thank you that we can go on the internet and just watch R.C. to our heart's content and read his books and his sermons. And Lord, we pray that you would raise up more R.C.'s and more people to Uh, lead the church in these matters of faith being logical and reasonable and Lord challenging us to think more deeply on these things. Pray that you will help us to um, think also on some of the things that were near and dear to his heart and the holiness of you and um, the need for us to have an intermediary, a mediator, and we are beyond thankful that you have given us one in Jesus Christ. And so Lord, please let everything be done to the glory of him. Thankful for this time together. Dismiss us with your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Robert Charles. Hit it, Justin. Another successful movie. Yes. <laughs> Mike. A little out of practice. Can we go over the question?